Assalamu alaikum and hello viewers. Foreign policy is an important subject of international relations. We can have understanding about the motives of a state while studying foreign policy. Foreign policy gives a direction to a state to pursue a certain course of action. So foreign policy can be coercive if it puts pressures on other states, if it coerces an other state, it puts economic sanctions on the states and it pushes states to a negative direction if it is not in the interest of a state and pressurized by a powerful state then that foreign policy can be coercive but sometimes foreign policies can be peaceful as well so in this interconnected world in this era of globalization, the subject of foreign policy has got much importance and significance. Many scholars in the world, they want to study about the behavior of the leaders and the behaviors of the states that what things or factors are responsible while shaping and giving a direction to foreign policy of a certain state. At least we can understand that uh, no state in the world is without foreign policy. Each state has its own foreign policy, either in full independence or it uh, may have uh, some uh, alliance with other states, commitments with other states, or may have a weaker position uh, in comparison with a powerful state to exert its pressure. So, the subject of foreign policy, it is of great significance for the scholars, for the readers, for the teachers of international relations and politics, that they understand the goals of states, what they want to achieve, and also the national interest, where they want to go. The main thing behind foreign policy of any state, that is to achieve its national interest, to promote its agenda, to secure its uh, issues to secure its interest at the global level. For this reason, states even they go to war, states they exert influence, states they give aids to economic aids to other states, states they uh, give assistance, technical assistance, military assistance, economic assistance, or in any other field, states. Uh, they uh, even want to join international organizations. They also join international alliances. So all these things show that states are behind their national interests. So national interest, it is the prime one and it is permanent in the agendas of the states. So here, why to study foreign policy? Of course, main thing, uh, to study foreign policy, that is uh, to know about the puzzling decisions. Sometimes there are some very critical, very interesting and rare decisions taken by the states. Then the readers and scholars, they want to study them that why, what were the factors that these leaders, they took such and such decisions. I mean, that uh, these puzzling decisions, it gives more understanding and it creates a debate between the scholars to produce much scholarship. Here is an example of the 1938th Munich Agreement. The agreement was signed between the great powers of the Europe. Uh, that was to stop Hitler from the advancement from his uh, hegem hegemonistic designs in the Europe. What he was demanding, I have already explained in one of my previous videos that how he was demanding about a small strip of land that was called Sudetenland inside the boundaries of Czechoslovakia. So Hitler said that it was historically part of Germany. The people ethnically, uh, culturally, by language, uh, they were German, so that's why then the part of Czechoslovakia, Sudetenland, should be given back to Germany. A conference was held at the German city Munich in 1938, and uh, uh, then the European powers, they were agreed to give 
this land, this uh, small strip of land to Germany. The main architect in this agreement that was the Prime Minister of Britain, uh, Mr. Chamberlain, uh, and he uh, also convinced the other European powers for such move. So then this land was given back to Germany and after that uh, uh, Hitler also uh, occupied the entire uh, Czechoslovakia and after that uh, Czechoslovakia uh, was sharing common border with uh, uh, Poland. Then Poland was attacked by Germany. So that was the first day of uh, the World War II in 1939. That's why it, uh, even today it is called the betrayal policy that Germany and the Hitler, uh, they betrayed the European powers and uh, scholars they are of the view that if this agreement had not signed, then the World War II would not happen. It is also called appeasement policy. And what is appeasement? That when uh, enemy gives concessions to its own enemy, then it is called uh, uh, appeasement policy. So the European powers, uh, especially the Britain, uh, was giving concessions to Germany, um, where uh, both of them, they were rivals to one another. So this uh, uh, agreement was signed in uh, 1938. That's why scholars then they wanted to study the foreign policy of Germany and also of the British. And it was one of the reasons that Chamberlain, he lost his premiership and uh, after that uh, he could not succeed, uh, succeeded and uh, to be prime minister of the Britain. Another example uh, we have, uh, that is the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the Soviet Union and the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, installed nuclear missiles on the soil of Cuba. And it was a uh, uh, very critical condition situation for the world leaders, especially for the United States. Uh, these crises were resolved uh, peacefully, although there were high tensions uh, between not only between the United States and Cuba, but also between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, it was that uh, Soviet Union and uh, US or Cuba and US, they were on the brink of a nuclear war. So then these crises were resolved and uh, the missiles from Cuba were removed. So scholars, uh, they wrote too much in uh, the uh, literature of international relations. They also wrote books, uh, research papers, and they done and uh, um, carried uh, their research on these Cuban missile crisis, that what were the factors and why leaders, uh, they uh, take uh, such decisions. It is generally considered that uh, uh, leaders, they are rational. So if states and leaders, they are rational, then why they take decisions which turns bad in future? The third example that is we have Saddam Hussein of Iraq. He invaded Kuwait and when uh, he invaded, uh, actually he was considering that uh, United States was busy uh, in Central Asia and also in Eastern Europe because uh, um, uh, socialism was a decay uh, there in Eastern Europe and also uh, there were too much disturbance in Soviet Union, their Central Asian states, the other Eurasian states from uh, Soviet Union, they were moving towards their own independence. So Saddam Hussein, uh, he just imagined that United States would not react, but it was very much sudden for Saddam that United States not only responded, but responded uh, with uh, heavy force that the U.S. formed alliance against uh, Saddam Hussein of Iraq. So have what we can call it as a poor judgment. Uh, scholars, they are of the view that leaders, they are rational. But later on, these are the consequences which uh, turns a decision into a good one or bad one. Actually, many things are responsible. I have already discussed in my previous videos about the internal determinants, external determinants, about uh, the leader's perception, about the uh, leader's uh, training, uh, the role of advisors, the role of bureaucracy, and so many other things are involved and responsible in foreign policy making and also in the implementation of foreign policy. But uh, here to say that uh, 
the international environment of course and also the behavior of the states the reaction of the states they are very much crucial about turning a decision as a good or bad decision uh, there is also a confusion between the large n and small n problem. What is large n? That is the large number and small n, that is the small number. So large n, uh, I mean that when Chamberlain, uh, he, uh, he was uh, actually uh, uh, was discussing uh, these things with Germany, he wanted to stop World War II. He wanted to halt Germany. Uh, Hitler, the other European powers from going into uh, another uh, big war, the World War II. And he was comparing the situation with the First World War, which was already ended in 1919. So uh, that was only 19 years old war, First World War, uh, which was ended. Uh, that's why Chamberlain was very much concerned that, okay, we could give this um, small strip of land to Germany and then we can save the world from another uh, world war but uh, he was just comparing this thing with the one thing I mean that was the first world war so large n it says that we have to compare a situation with more other situations with more other same problems and issues that is also called analogical reasoning that uh, uh, when uh, leaders they compare their own situation and their own problems uh, their own decisions with already held decisions and problems in the history so the scholars they say that if uh, he had to compare this with uh, more than one and with many uh, such uh, situations then possible that uh, munich agreement not happened uh, what is small a number small n that okay uh, even if uh, you mm, uh, a leader can compare a decision uh, a situation with one or two uh, the same kind of uh, situations or decisions held and made in the history but it should be in detail that to we each and everything and uh, to uh, have cost and benefit analysis and to consider each and every point and a factor so by this uh, then the leaders they can reach to a, a proper and a certain decision so this small n and large n number that's also a confusion and it is also an issue in a foreign policy uh, making so leaders if they are considered rational that why they take such decisions which later on uh, criticized uh, by the policymakers, by the statesmen, by the politicians, by the readers, by the uh, scholars across the globe. Actually, it is uh, when leaders, they take decision, of course, they have advisors, they have bureaucracy, they have a team of experts, and uh, they have their own uh, government, uh, government setup, and all these things, they have their own intellect as well. Uh, and also, they have to consider the internal determinants, the domestic constraints, and also the international constraints and international opportunities opportunities but uh, they are not aware about their future later on uh, this is the future which uh, 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 turns a decision into a good or a bad one because the consequences uh, if it, uh, the consequences are good uh, uh, and they are uh, positive for the state then uh, a decision will be good and if it is not in the favor of the uh, state's interest it will be bad so many people they also criticize Pakistan joining war on terror if we look to the situation that why Musharraf joined this war on terror of course he had to consider his own uh, constraints his own opportunities and uh, he was also saying that uh, he wanted to have some bargaining and positive development on Kashmir issue and also on Pakistan's economy 
to have regard for uh, Pakistan's uh, sovereignty and also for the nuclear program. But later on, what are the consequences of this uh, Pakistan joining war on terror for Pakistan have a disturbed uh, the Pakistan's state and society. So we all know that uh, uh, there is a, a huge and big damage for Pakistan's economy, infrastructure, for Pakistan's society uh, and um, uh, for uh, even in person and both in military and civilian person that many people uh, they were killed so this to judge whether a decision is good or bad of course we have to look for the consequences dear viewers keep watching the channel subscribe it and press the bell icon to be informed with my new video uploads take care goodbye